So our question this evening is this. Who witnesses the great white throne judgment? Who witnesses, who's present for the great white throne judgment? So we're talking about this event over here, the great white throne judgment. If you were to describe that in the language that people just normally use, they would call it judgment day. People have an idea, they have an understanding that at some point they have to appear before God. They know that. And what they're thinking of oftentimes is they're thinking of the great white throne judgment. And what I want to do is I want to look at, the, at a couple questions related to the great white throne judgment, but we'll focus most of our time on the question of who are the witnesses to the great white throne judgment. So let me introduce the subject this way, and we're going to go to uh, Revelation 20 verse 12 in just a moment. Um, the great white throne judgment is a legal proceeding. That's what it is. There's a judge, there are trials, there, is, there are findings of fact, there is declaration of guilt, there is the imposition of sentence. The great white throne judgment in almost every particular resembles a typical criminal trial. That, that's what it's very much like. If you look with me at Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, the first thing we want to just make sure we're clear on is who is the judge at the great white throne judgment? Revelation 20 verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, let's go up to verse 11 just for a minute. And I saw a great white throne. Well, that's why this is called the great white throne judgment. So we're over here after the millennial kingdom, uh, after Satan is cast into the lake of fire. And the great white throne of judgment occurs right here. And it's described in verse 12 <clears throat> as the dead, small, and great stand before God. So who's the judge at the great white throne judgment? It's God. But we're actually given a little more detail about that. So look with me at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So we know that, that God is going to be the judge at the great white throne judgment. That, that makes perfect sense. That's what we would naturally think. What's interesting to note, look with me at Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's talking about the great white throne judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who do you think that is? Is it a Supreme Court justice? I don't think so. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Revelation 20 verse 12 told us that the judge at the great white throne judgment was God. Acts 17 31 gives us another little detail. Who is it specifically that's the judge? You get three guesses. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, or God the Son. So which one is it? Well, it has to be God the Son because it's the one that was raised from the dead. So at the great white throne judgment, the judge is the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the ramifications of that is that the man who remains lost during this life, in other words, someone who rejects the gospel, rejects the offer of salvation made available by the Lord Jesus Christ. He refuses the Lord as Savior, but he will face him as judge. That's what happens. Sad, isn't it? Not only sad, but 
but terrifying. It, it emphasizes the importance of believing the gospel in this life and being saved. <clears throat> Get with me Revelation chapter 19. I now want to turn to look at the question of who will be present to witness the great white throne judgment. And I want you to notice a couple things. Revelation 19, verse 20. So in Revelation 19, go ahead and look at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Uh, And then if you uh, look with me at verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So the person that's on the, on the white horse in Revelation 19, who is it? Well, it's, it's obviously Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ returns to the earth in Revelation 19. Now, if we look at verse 20, we're going to see some of the things that he immediately accomplishes when he returns to earth. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So notice something. Does the beast, does the false prophet, do they show up at the great white throne to be judged? They don't. The great white throne judgment is after the millennium. The second coming is before the millennium. In Revelation 19, when the Lord returns to the earth, (coughs) he takes the beast and the false prophet at that point in time, and they are cast, what? Alive into the lake of fire. Literally, they're just grabbed, and what? (coughs) And they're in the lake of fire, (coughs) and they're going to be there forever. So they're not going to be witnesses at the great white throne judgment because the Lord Jesus Christ has already decreed their eternal fate and he's already begun their punishment. Now look with me at Revelation chapter 20 and look at verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired... So Revelation 20, verse 7 is right at the end of the millennium. It's the thousand years are expired. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now notice verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So let's notice a distinction here. At the second coming, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire at that point. God has no further use for them. It is now time for them to begin receiving, to to begin their eternal punishment. But God doesn't do that with Satan. What God does with Satan during the millennium is he's cast into prison. He's shut up so that he can deceive the nations no more. But after the millennium, at the end of it, he has to be loosed. And he has to be loosed for how long? A little season. Why is that? What happens during the millennium is that when the Lord Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron, there will be, by and large, external obedience. What do I mean by that? Have you ever been in a situation where you had to obey something because it was forced upon you, but you resented it? In your heart, you would have wanted to rebel. 
you would have wanted to fight it, but you knew, I can't fight this. It's too big for me. Well, when Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron, there's a lot of people that are going to be making that calculation in their minds. In other words, I don't like this guy. I wish he wasn't running things. But the problem is, he rules with a rod of iron. And the people that cross him, they get cast into the lake of fire, even during the millennium. So they're going to be quietly, they'll be internally hateful. They'll be internally rebellious, but outwardly they'll comply. The reason that Satan is let loose is to reveal man's heart. How many people does Satan gather together? If you recall what it says there in verse 8, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Well, that's a lot. So how many people are there, do you think, on the earth at that time that resent the Lord Jesus Christ's rule? They were just fearful to do anything about it. But when Satan gets out of the bottomless pit, what does he do? He deceives them. He says, look, guys, we got this. Look, I was in prison for a little while. Sure, they got me, but look, I busted my way out because I'm smooth, I'm strong, I'm cool, I'm collected. We got this. Let's go up to Jerusalem and kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what you would hope is someone says, um, point of order, uh, do you remember what happened last time? Last time, when he returned to the earth, blood flowed for 200 miles. Read that. It's in Revelation. I don't think it's a good idea to go up to Jerusalem and try to kill him. I'm thinking that's just a really bad life decision. But he deceives them because of what's in their hearts. Well, Revelation 20, verse 10, what happens is when Satan performs, if you will, this last act of service, revealing the wickedness of man's hearts during the millennium, God has no further use for him, and it is time for Satan to begin serving his eternal sentence in the lake of fire. So what all that tells us is this. At the great white throne judgment, Satan's not there. He's in the lake of fire. The beast isn't there. He's in the lake of fire. The false prophet isn't there. Now we know, um, get with me Revelation 12 before we go on. Before we go to the next point, let me, let me make one other comment. Look at Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now think about that just for a moment. Satan in the scriptures is described as the tempter. He tempts people to do evil. He's called not only the tempter, but also the accuser. So imagine how obnoxious you have to be to tempt, tempt, do it, do it. You know you want to do it. You know you want to. Come on, go ahead and do it. To tempt people, and then as soon as they do what you tempted them to do, what do you do? You accuse them before God, and what does it say? Day and night. Obnoxious is too kind a word for what that is. But here's what I want you to notice. Satan is the accuser of the brethren in that what he constantly does is make accusations against God's people. But what's fascinating is that at the great white throne judgment, he's not even present. Satan is not part of the prosecution team. God has no use for him. Satan's accusations of God's people was not something that God required to happen. God didn't need Satan to let him know that, the body, that, that people had sinned. He didn't need that information. He already had it. Satan did it for his own purposes, if you will. So it's just fascinating to note that 
at the great wide throne judgment, Satan and his minions, Satan, these false prophet aren't there. God doesn't need them for their accusations. They're, they're already serving their punishment. Now, there is no specific verse that I'm aware of that tells you everyone who will witness the great white throne judgment. There's, there's no, no verse that tells you that. Now, we know clearly that the lost will appear there. The dead, small and great, stand before God. So all of the lost of the ages appear there, not really as witnesses, but as defendants. In other words, they are on trial. But the question we want to consider is, who are the, the witnesses? Who, who watches this happen? And although there is no verse that specifically lists the witnesses, I'm going to suggest the following to you, and that is this. There are a multitude of verses in the scriptures that establish the general principle that the righteous shall see the destruction of the wicked. If you take that principle, what that would suggest is that all saved people throughout time, people saved during time past, the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace, people saved after the rapture, during the 70th week, or during the kingdom, all the saved of all time, I suggest to you, will be witnesses at the great white throne judgment. And I say that because there is a very clear scriptural principle that the righteous shall see the judgment that God imposes upon the guilty. So now I've said that, can I prove it? Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, these are martyrs, and for the testimony which they held. Now notice verse 10. Now if these were the souls of them that were slain, these are people that are deceased, right? That's what they are. Notice their heart attitude in verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So let me ask you a question. When someone is martyred and killed by evildoers, they die and they're now in the afterlife? Do they have the attitude of, I don't care? Or do they have a righteous desire to see vengeance? Not mean-spirited, not sinful, but a righteous desire to see vengeance. Revelation 6 tells you very clearly that they do. Look at verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, partway here through the 70th week, there's a bunch of martyrs in heaven, uh, or in the next life, let's say. They're under the altar. And what do they say? God, when are you going to avenge us? And what's said is, Guys, just, just rest because they're going to kill more of us. They're going to kill more of your brethren. They're going to be martyred. Doesn't say they're not going to be avenged. Just says you got to wait for my timing because there's still more that are going to be martyred. Get with me, Job 22. Job 22. Now, while you're getting Job, I'll share with you this thought. What typically happens 
in life when someone is murdered in terms of what happens in the courtroom. Well, one of the things that's fairly common is that the victim's family will attend the trial. Why do they attend the trial? They attend the trial because they're, they're wanting to witness justice be done. That, that's, that's what they're doing. So that, that, that's why they're there. Well, just as that is true in earthly affairs, wouldn't it also hold true in heavenly affairs? Because justice, the principles of justice are the principles of justice. Look at Job 22, verse 15. Job 22, verse 15. <laughs> Hast thou marked the old way, which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of wicked is far from me. Now notice verse 19. The righteous see it and are glad. See, the the wicked were cut down, and how did the righteous feel about it? They were glad. They, They were, they're not happy to see someone suffer harm. They are satisfied with justice being carried out. Look with me at Psalm 37. See, what what those verses are saying is that the, the desire to see, the, the desire to see punishment carried out appropriately is a righteous desire. It's not evil. It's not wrong. Look with me at Job 37. Psalm 37. I was just testing the studio audience. They passed. Psalm 37, verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. Notice the next part. When the wicked are cut off, Thou shalt see it. Isn't that interesting? It's not enough for them to be assured that the wicked will be punished. What do they have to do? They have to see it. Get with me Psalm 52. Psalm chapter 52. Psalm 52. And look with me at verse 5. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away, and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So God destroys the wicked forever. And what it says about the righteous is the righteous also shall see. Do they have to witness it? Sure seems like they do, doesn't it? Psalm 58. Psalm 58. Psalm 58, verse 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Again, the righteous have to see the vengeance upon the wicked. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. 
what God's telling his people is, you're going to see it. You're going to see the reward, the recompense that is visited upon the wicked. Psalm 107. Now, hopefully you notice, we're looking at so many verses here, you're seeing that this is a consistent principle of God's judgment. So, even if these verses don't specifically have the words great white throne in them, it's telling you something about how God operates. And by the way, think about this with me for a minute. If the righteous see the judgment of the wicked, how does a murder victim see the judgment of the wicked? They don't see it on this earth, right? I mean, if there's, if there's someone, an innocent person, mind their own business, and they're killed, so the wicked has murdered them, do they see justice on this earth? I mean, they don't, right? I mean, they're, they're gone. I mean, maybe they, you could say, I guess they look from heaven, but that's not a sufficient answer either because is every murderer in this life actually prosecuted? Is every murderer in this life actually caught? They're not all caught. So the only way that the righteous can fully see the judgment of the wicked, this is the only place it could possibly be. It's not, it's not something that happens on this earth. Psalm 107, verse 40. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Verse 42. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Proverbs 29. Proverbs Chapter 29, verse 16. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Notice that. How many of man's works are brought into judgment? All of them. Let me ask you this. When, when, when someone is charged with a crime and, and he's prosecuted, does the prosecutor have a list of every bad thing that guy's ever done and now he's going to get punished for them in a court? Or did they catch him on the one thing they had evidence for? Well, they caught him on the one thing they had evidence for. There's a whole bunch of things they didn't know about. Human knowledge is limited. And by and large, he gets away with them in this life. Often, oftentimes. But does God know every single one of them? And does he bring them into judgment at the great white throne? He does. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And look with me at verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be revealed known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. So, a couple things on that. When it says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. I don't know if you ever watch any of the true crime stuff on TV, But there's all these debates. Who was Jack the Ripper? Was it this guy? Was it that guy? Who shot JFK? Who did it? There's different theories. I, I don't know. But will it be revealed? It will all be revealed. All of the unsolved criminal mysteries of time are revealed right here. All the shenanigans that people hide 
they cover up, do they get revealed? They all get revealed. There's no secrets. And then I, I love this part here. Verse 3. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. When people do evil, do they shout it or do they whisper it? They whisper it, don't they? This will be a carnal reference. Maybe it'll mean something to you. Maybe it won't. There's a scene in the Godfather, the Godfather movies, where the mafia boss wants to have someone killed. And he just looks at one of his henchmen, just winks. The henchman knows what it means. He knows what it means. If anyone ever asked him later, did you give an order to do that? I would never do such a thing. I would, how dare you accuse me of such a thing? It's communicated subtly. It's communicated with deniability. But do the people involved know what's going on? Yes. Even if man can't prove it, God knows. And will it be revealed? It shall be. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Fascinating verse. Revelation 2 5 is talking about the great white throne judgment. It calls it what? The day of wrath. There's no one that shows up at the great white throne judgment that is declared innocent. The people that show up there are guilty. That's why it's called the day of wrath. And then it's called, notice what it says, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. One of the things that's going to happen at the great white throne judgment, think about what's going to occur. At the end of the great white throne judgment, all of the guilty are cast into the lake of fire. And they're cast into the lake of fire for how long? Eternally. Well, if they're cast into the lake of fire eternally to receive eternal punishment, that decision better be right. And for the good of the universe... The witnesses of the universe have to be satisfied that the decision was right. Sometimes do people attend a trial and the result is a miscarriage of justice? It gets the wrong answer. And people look at it and say, that's horrible. There was all that evidence. This result is clearly wrong. It cannot be the case that we go into eternity and people in the universe believe God is an unfair judge. He sent those people to the lake of fire and they didn't deserve it. Now notice what Romans 2.5 says. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath. Isn't that fascinating? See, what most men want to do is they want to treasure up riches, right? How much money do you need to be satisfied? More than I got, right? Isn't that the hard attitude? Whatever you got, you wish you had more. And so people try to treasure up stuff, whether it's money or possessions or things. That's what they want to do. Well, what do they actually do? I mean, think about this with me for a minute. If God is going to judge every work, and indeed he is, then guess what happens every single day you live if you don't get saved? You commit sin after sin 
after sin. And God is a just judge. So if you commit more sins, you have to have greater punishment. Lost men treasure up unto themselves wrath. Get with me 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. You can't hide it. Revelation 15. Revelation 15. Revelation 15. And look with me at verse 1. Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. Notice, for thy judgments are made manifest. They're made obvious, clear, transparent to everyone. They're easy to see. Revelation 19, verse 1. Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. They praised God for that judgment that he imposed. And now I want to show you a couple of verses that talk about the righteous seeing their desire upon their enemies. Get Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Psalm 54, verse 7. For he hath delivered me out of all trouble, and mine eye hath seen his desire upon mine enemies. Psalm 59. And there are a couple here I'm going to read in a row. Maybe I'll have a chance to turn to them, maybe not, but I'll, I'll read them to you. Psalm 59, verse 10. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Just like Revelation 6, those souls under the altar. Psalm 92, 11. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. Psalm 112, verse 8. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Psalm 118, verse 7. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Jeremiah 11, verse 20. But, O Lord of hosts, that judges righteously, that triest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. Jeremiah 20, verse 12. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and seest the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them them. Now, hopefully what you've been convinced of is this. There's not one verse or two verse or three verses or four verses. I mean, how many verses do we cover? It, it is extremely obvious that there is a scriptural principle that the righteous have to witness the destruction of the guilty. That principle is established again and again and again and again. And we know that the great white throne judgment is clearly a legal proceeding, and it has to be conducted in a way that gives confidence to the universe that justice has been done. What would be worse than going to heaven, spending it heaven, spending time in heaven for all eternity, and reaching the conclusion that God is an unjust judge? So, yeah, you're here, but the Creator God the guy that runs everything, he's not just. He's corrupt. 
He punishes people for no reason. He's unfair. That would be horrible. That will never, ever, ever happen. Number one, because God is just. And number two, the great white throne judgment proceeding will be conducted in a way that at the end of it, all of the witnesses will realize, they will say, this was fair. This was just. The case was proven. The punishment is just. There's not going to be unreliable testimony. There's not going to be false accusation. Everything is going to be perfectly, validly established. Get Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 7. We're almost done. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. I believe this is a reference to the great white throne. Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And of course, we know from, from Acts 17 that this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousand, thousands, a thousand thousand is a million. Millions ministered unto him. Then notice what it says. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Well, that's at least 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. The judgment was set and the books were opened. That's exactly what Revelation 20 is talking about at the great white throne judgment. So think about this. The normal criminal trial has one defendant. Some criminal trials have multiple defendants. It's not common, but some do. What happens at this one? Well, every single defendant, every single lost man gets their day in court. And this is going to take some time, isn't it? Because they each get their day. And the purpose of the proceeding is not to convict them of one sin. It's to convict them of every sin they ever did because they treasured up unto themselves wrath. So that God is just when he says, you will be cast into the lake of fire and you will receive this particular punishment, this particular level of punishment because it matches your wicked acts. That's what's going to happen there. Now, I do want to make one contrast, and then we'll wrap up. The judgment seat of Christ is a family affair. What do I mean by that? If you're lost, you show up at the great white throne judgment as a defendant. You're on trial. If you're saved, you show up at the great white throne as a witness. But what happens to members of the body of Christ? Are they ever judged? They are judged. They're judged at the judgment seat of Christ, which takes place after the catching up. But one thing that's fascinating, are there any lost people that are there? Are there lost people that are there that see the wicked acts of the body of Christ and they laugh and scoff and say, ha, that guy's a member of the body of Christ. What a clown. Did you see the things he did? He did all those wicked things. Well, the body of Christ ain't so great. Well, the wicked aren't going to be there to say that. And the judgment seat of Christ for the body of Christ is not about going to heaven or hell. It's about the rewards that members of the body of Christ receive for their service. So that's why I call the judgment seat of Christ a family affair. It's, it's members of the body of Christ. There's no lost people there. But the lost will end up here, and they will give account. So I'll close with this thought. Sometimes we look around us, we see the wickedness in society, we see people get away with things where they're not going to be caught. They're not going to be prosecuted. Everyone knows what they did, and they're going to get away with it in human terms. 
But are they really going to get away with it? They're not going to. They will answer for it. So that tells us this. We can be confident that justice will be done. God will set everything straight. But you know what our responsibility is right now? We need to see the lost reconciled. And you know why that is? Because God forgave us some pretty bad things, didn't he? If we're honest with ourselves, did God forgive us some stuff that, that was pretty horrid, what I did. It's pretty terrible. Yet God forgave me. Well, you know what I need to do, according to 2 Corinthians 5? I need to have a ministry of reconciliation so that other sinners just like me, they can hear the gospel, believe it, and be saved, and therefore avoid the great white throne judgment and avoid the lake of fire. That's what we need to be about. So let's give thanks for who we are in Christ. Thank God we're not going to the great white throne judgment as defendants. Thank God that we have a position of eternal blessedness in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you and we give you praise for, for all that you have done. You have been so gracious and forgiving. You planned our salvation before the beginning of the world. You designed for the Lord Jesus Christ to pay for the sins of mankind so that we could have eternal life as a free gift. We thank you for that. We rejoice in that gift. We give you all the glory, and we are thankful for all that you are. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.